Uh, good morning, church. Today's, today's scripture reading is in the book of Mark uh, 14, chapters 53 through 62. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now the chief priest and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witnesses against him, but their testimonies did not agree. When some rose up and bore false witness against him, Jesus saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days, I will build another one made without hands. But not even then did their testimonies agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you still answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, <clears throat> the Son of the blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. When you're on the platform, there's some limitations you experience. Like, I'd like to know who is the soprano and who is the alto in the duet we just heard. <laughs> Were you the lower voice? Yeah. yeah, okay. I was trying to watch their breathing patterns to figure out who had the high notes, but I couldn't figure it out. Well, m maybe we'll have them come up and do that again sometime, and I'll study more. What's that? Uh, yeah, there you go. You, you want the notes? Oh, you didn't mean now. Last Sabbath, Jesus was arrested. He's taken immediately before the spiritual high priest who tries to get him to say something that he could, he could use against him. Of course, that didn't pan out. So Annas, baffled and a little bit irritated, sends him to Caiaphas, the political high priest. And the meeting occurs between Jesus, the high priest, and the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is the political religious governing body, has about 71 members. Now, unfortunately, John's gospel doesn't tell us a whole lot about what goes on during this hearing, but luckily... Alan shared with you the critical details from the book of Mark. In our scripture reading, you heard that the religious powers brought a lot of false witnesses who lied about Jesus. And finally, Caiaphas asks Jesus if he's the Messiah, to which Jesus answers, I am. I wasn't there. We don't have it recorded. But I can almost guarantee you when Jesus said, I am, Caiaphas smiled. He thought he had him. He proclaims that Jesus commits blasphemy. And he asks the Sanhedrin to give their verdict. They, of course, all assert that Jesus deserves to die. Then these religious folks, I say that tongue in cheek, spit on Jesus, blindfold Jesus, hit him with their fists, and take him to Pilate. And from what follows between Pilate and Jesus, we can glean two principles that we can use today to make better decisions. It's in the early morning when Jesus arrives at Pilate's official residency near the temple. The accusers of Jesus don't go in. John 
18, verse 28. <clears throat> then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. During Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jews weren't allowed to go into any building, any home that they thought might contain leaven. So they're not going into the Romans' house for sure. And I find it interesting that this group of religious leaders choose to follow this rule about not going into a house that might have the wrong kind of bread. While they have ignored lots and lots of their own legal rules of how to conduct an inquiry and hold a trial. You talk about selective attention. This is important because it serves my needs. Eh, we don't really care about those. They just get in our way. It's also interesting that the Jews thought it more important to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness than it was to prevent the execution of an innocent man. Their values are a little bit mixed up in my mind. They have the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Since the Jews don't go into Pilate's house, he comes out and speaks with them. He asks what charge they bring against Jesus. The Jews tell Pilate that Jesus is a criminal. Pilate goes, oh, if that's all he is, you folks take care of that. I'm going back to bed. The crowd isn't listening to logic. They don't want to resolve this appropriately. They're dealing with emotion. And their emotions are riled up. They object, saying it is unlawful for them, the Jews, to put anyone to death. Which is probably the only truthful thing they've said so far in this story. It is unlawful for the Jews to kill anybody. Only the Romans have the authority to execute criminals. But again, my mind works funny when I prepare these things. If the Romans are the only ones who can put somebody to death, how did Stephen get stoned? Didn't he die? Didn't he get killed by the Jews? Where were the Romans in that story? My guess, it's purely a guess, is that Jesus probably could have been killed just like Stephen and no one would have cared. Romans really didn't get too excited. They didn't really care that Stephen got stoned. My guess is if Jesus got stoned, that would have been okay. However, Jews don't want to take matters into their own hands. They want the Romans to kill Jesus. Jesus is popular among the common people. The Sanhedrin wants him killed by the Romans, therefore they're not involved. Oh, too bad, we're sorry they did that to you. They want Jesus crucified to protect themselves. I'm not responsible. Pilate had it done. But Jesus needed to be crucified to fulfill prophecy. So the fact that Pilate is being used by the Sanhedrin to advance the Sanhedrin's political agenda falls into what God prophesied would happen to his son. Jesus has already even told his disciples back in Matthew chapter 10 that the chief priests and the scribes would condemn him to death. In our story, the plot thickens. In Luke chapter 23, verse 2, the Jews accuse Jesus of claiming to be Israel's king. A moment ago, he was just a criminal. Now he's claiming to be King, they can't even get their story straight. 
And it's true from a Roman's perspective, if someone claims to be a king, that would be insurrection. That's a big deal from a Roman's perspective. Which is why the Jews changed the story. They couldn't prove Jesus to be a criminal. And Pilate wanted the evidence. When I can't make that lie work, I make up a new lie. So now he's a political insurrectionist. The kingdom needs a king, and the Jews assert that Jesus claims that it's him. So Pilate takes Jesus back into his house so he can have a private conversation. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus answers Pilate and says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Since the kingdom of God is spiritual, Jesus doesn't need human weapons. And if you remember from a couple Sabbaths ago, he has 72,000 angels on standby if he needs help. It's not an earthly kingdom. Pilate understands that Jesus is not a political threat. Look at verse 37. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate understands that even if he is the king of the Jews, it's not a political threat to Caesar. After Jesus answers, Pilate asks, what is truth? In verse 38, But that's one of those rhetorical questions because he doesn't really want the answer. He moves on to the next issue. John's Gospel doesn't tell us then what Pilate finds out. John's Gospel doesn't tell us that Pilate finds out that Jesus is a Galilean. Luckily, Dr. Luke does. So he sends him off to Herod, the guy who... Beheaded John the Baptist. This is that Herod. John tells us that Pilate sees Jesus, doesn't have any political ambitions. He's not a threat. And to kind of disengage from a no-win situation, he sends him on to Herod, hoping that he doesn't have to deal with the problem. And he reminds the Jews, that as their custom was, he would release one prisoner for Passover. John chapter 18, verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Okay, Mark's gospel also adds that he was a murderer. Whichever one, he was a criminal. And the masses want him released and do away with this guy that's causing us trouble. Jews are making some bad decisions in this story. They choose to lie. They choose to fabricate evidence. They choose not to follow the rules. They're selective in what rules they want to follow. When one lie doesn't work, they choose to have another lie. They're making some bad decisions. Find Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15 verse 10 tells us why they're making bad decisions. Mark chapter 15, verse 10. For he, referring to Pilate, for Pilate knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. 
All those bad choices in our story can be attributed to envy within the leadership of the Jewish community. I had to look up what envy was to make sure I understood. A feeling of discontent or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. Would the chief priests be envious of the qualities of Jesus? Probably. Envy, a desire to have a quality, possession, or other desirable attributes belonging to someone else. Chief priests probably are envious of the miracles that Jesus can do, the wonders that Jesus does, and the following that he generates by being so nice and so benevolent. Envy was the negative emotion that influenced the chief priests. They saw Jesus was gaining in popularity. You remember he kind of disrupted the financial monopoly that Annas had in the temple. So the Jewish leaders conclude that unless he's arrested and killed, their own influence would continue to diminish. And we certainly couldn't have that. So they are envious of Jesus and they want to take action to fix the problem. The Bible has a lot to say about envy. We could be here for a couple hours because the list is rather long of passages, but I'm just going to share with you three. You'll get the idea real quick. Find Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, land in verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which were not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Paul is showing what happens to people when they leave God out of their lives, apparently like the high priests have been doing. And the end result, as Paul points out later, later in the book of Romans, is that the person will become a slave to sin because their life doesn't know anything different. Envy, not a good thing. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy. No one who enjoys an immoral lifestyle described in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21 should anticipate being in God's kingdom. God expects the members of his kingdom to act in a different way. Finally, land in the book of Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 Verses 3 through 5. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of the love of, our, of God our Savior towards men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Harboring envy in our hearts will do a couple things. One, it'll lead you to make a whole rash of bad decisions. And two, it'll probably keep you out of the kingdom. My suggestion is, we get rid of envy in our hearts. And you go, okay, how? Well, that's one of those things that you can't do on your own. But luckily, the Holy Spirit can guide you into all truth convict you of sin, and can get you on the road to righteousness. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 reminds us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If you want to make better decisions, get rid of the envy that resides in your heart. Because it will lead you to make choices just as confusing as what we've seen the high priests and the Jewish mob doing thus far. After condemning Jesus, Pilate orders him to be flogged, scourged. It was an attempt to appease the Jewish leaders without actually killing the guy. Now, if you've never seen the whip used for a flogging, it's not a pretty sight. A bunch of leather straps in which are embedded any objects that would lacerate the skin. Bone, nails, rocks, whatever they could find that would increase the pain. After being flogged, the mistreatment of Jesus continues as if being flogged wasn't enough. By the way, do you know why he got 39 lashes? Because legally, in the Roman system, 40 lashes was the same as a death sentence. That's why they stopped at 39. Look at John chapter 19. Verses 1 through 4. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate, Pilate, sorry, Pilate went out again and said to them, the mass, the mob, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I found no fault in him. Jesus is wearing a crown of thorns, a purple robe. He's probably so weak from the flogging and the beating that the Roman soldiers have to hold him up. Some of the experts I read said that they probably have beaten him so badly that he was unrecognizable. You wouldn't know who he is because his body had been so damaged. Pilate says, behold the man. He wants the crowd to see Jesus. Thinking that their lust would have been satisfied and Pilate could release the prisoner. If you ever just want a reinforcement to your understanding of how much Jesus loves you, when you get home this afternoon or tomorrow or whenever you think of it, go to Google Images and put in Jesus being flogged. And then click on Images and spend some time thinking about what he endured. And we're not even at the cross yet. Pilate hopes the sight of the severely beaten man will change the hearts of the Jews. It doesn't work. Verse 6, Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Oh, please, that's enough. Hey, just see if you're listening. Crucify him. It's like you're halfway there. Finish the job. Pilate finds Jesus guilty of nothing. He's not a criminal. He's not an insurrectionist. He's an innocent man. Jewish leaders, knowing this would bring grave consequences if they killed him themselves, they don't want to do that, but they also want him killed. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, Peter has repeatedly judged Jesus innocent of civil charges. He's a criminal. No, he's not. He's an insurrectionist. No, he isn't. So now the Jews change the charge from a civil charge 
to a religious charge. First couple lies don't work. Just keep, you're going to find one sooner or later. Pilate. Pilate is bound by Roman law to protect Jewish religion. By the laws that he lives by and the law that he kind of governs the Jewish territory, he must protect their law. Their law that says nobody can claim to be the son of God. So if the Jews can convince Pilate that Jesus claimed to be the son of God, Pilate must kill him because it's the Jewish law. Does that make sense? Sanhedrin, the chief priests, have manipulated the political environment to advance their own personal cause. What we see in politics today is nothing new. It's been going on for a long time. When the Romans conquered the Jews, they followed the policy of leaving the local native people in place and allowed them to run their own, rule, their own society with their own rules. And Rome agreed to support the locals. The locals say, we need that guy killed. Pilate goes, okay. Look at John 19, verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard they, that saying, he was more afraid. And went again into his house, the Praetorium, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, You are not speaking to me. Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answers, You could have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater power. Pilate is trying to help Jesus as best he can. He's getting no help. And he's getting frustrated. Pilate asserts, I have the authority. <laughs> Jesus goes, no, you don't. No, you don't. You have whatever power my father has given you. Now, most of the guilt for Christ's execution rests with Caiaphas, the guy who manipulated the political world to get what he wanted done. But the Pilate must assume responsibility for the actions he takes. Most experts see Pilate as a pawn in the diabolical scheme of the high priests, but he's still responsible for his choices. Realizing that he's kind of going to get his hands dirty one way or the other, Pilate continues to get Jesus free. But the Jews shout that Pilate's no friend of Caesar if they let, or he lets, this guy go. And like most of us, we're concerned about you to some degree, but we're more concerned about this guy more. <laughs> And when I'm threatened, we'll take care of me first at the expense of you, which is what Pilate does. The Jews assert Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, and a king is a political threat to Caesar. So we've made it to verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Can you visualize the Jews really caring about Caesar in the first place? Me either. Then Pilate therefore heard the saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, another word I can't pronounce. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. John mentions the preparation for the Passover. And amongst all this consternation, all this fabrication, all this misdirection, all this political intrigue, 
John says it's the preparation for the Passover. That seems out of place. It doesn't fit within the rest of the story. Why does John slip that in? I don't know why, but I'm glad he did. Because in amongst the silliness of this story, we are reminded that Jesus is the long-awaited final sacrificial lamb. He has come to set the captives free. It's around 6 a.m. Pilate's a little bit miffed because he hasn't had you know, his visit to Starbucks yet. It's early in the morning. <laughs> the four of you that laughed, I know who drinks coffee now. <laughs> so, okay, the rest of you are going, what star, who, what? We don't want that yet, Mika. Thank you. <laughs> Mika's trying to be efficient. 6 a.m., Jesus hasn't slept. The crowd is still at work on Pilate. We've come to verse 15. But they cried out, the crowd, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, do we have no king but Caesar? You got to be kidding me. <laughs> Finally, Pilate gives up. He hands Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The first principle, if you want to make better decisions, was to get rid of the envy in our hearts. The second principle is seen by Pilate and the Jewish leadership. They are looking at short-term goals at the expense of the long-term goals. What can I do to make my life better today? I'll worry about next week, next week. If you want to make better decisions, worry about next week, today. When you make a decision, don't look at the next 36 hours, look at the next 36 days or 35 years. Sorry. <laughs> David has very good choice. It's Bonnie's that's a little bit suspect. Some of you will get that in a minute. Sorry about that. Short-term objectives at the cost of long-range advances. Both Pilate, the Sanhedrin, are more concerned with present power, prestige, and popularity than they are about eternity. They are more concerned about my paycheck next week than where my life will be two decades from now. And God knows this quirk of the human nature. He kind of knew that most of us think that way. Turn over to Colossians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. The Holy Spirit wants us to put the emphasis on the right syllable. The long-term consequences, not what happens tomorrow. If we translate what Paul wrote literally, it should say continually think of. Always think of long-term consequences instead of short-term gains. The term heavenly things pertains to Jesus and eternal life. Earthly things pertains to the world system that Satan's set up in direct opposition to God. Second principle, take the long view, not the short view. Counsels to parents, teachers, and students, page 234. Okay, Mika, slide number one. We open to ourselves the floodgates of woe or joy. Who determines whether we are happy or sad? We open to ourselves the floodgates of woe or joy if we permit our thoughts to be engrossed with the troubles and trifles of earth. Our hearts will be filled with unbelief, gloom, and foreboding. Kind of sounds like what Pilate's 
going through. Kind of what the chief priests are going through. I'm a little bit miffed because my financial income has been diminished because Jesus turned over the tables in the sanctuary. So I'll fix that, I'll get rid of him, and I'll get my money back. Slide number two. If we set our affections on things above, there's that big two-letter word again, if. If we set our affections on things above, the voice of Jesus will speak to our hearts, murmuring will cease, vex, and vexing thoughts will be lost in the praise of our Redeemer. Now think about this. If Sister White would have written 2,000 years ago, and Caiaphas and Annas would have read this, they could have made a whole different choice in the matter. If they would have chosen to think differently. Third slide. Thank you. Those who dwell upon God's great mercies. Which leads me to believe that I can choose not to dwell on God's great mercies. Those who dwell on God's great mercies will put on the girdle of gladness and take melody in their hearts to the Lord. Then they will enjoy their work. They will stand firm at their post of duty. They will have placid temper and a trustful spirit. Amen. Just think if the Sanhedrin would have done what you no longer can see. I have to thank Stephen, then I can, never mind. Can you see how things would have been different? If it could have been different for... Caiaphas, Annas, and the Sanhedrin, and Pilate, it can be different for us. Okay, now we're done. Thanks, Mika. If you want to make better decisions from God's perspective, then you have to refuse to have envy in your heart. And you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you get a new heart. This will be a moment of pause as you find Ezekiel chapter 37. Take your time, I'm thirsty. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. It's doable if you ask. He won't do it against your will. Second, after getting envy out of the picture, is to reflect on the long-term circumstances. Consequences, that would be even better. Consequences. I can do things that make my life better tomorrow, or I can do things that will make my life better 60 days from now. I have a really good habit of doing the first and not the latter. If this afternoon I go home, and do 35 sit-ups. Am I going to be sore in the morning? Aren't I? I'm just like, oh, I ain't doing that. I take the short-term view. I don't want to be sore in the morning. It's Sunday. My daughter's here. We're going to go do something fun. I don't want to be in misery. I'll forget the sit-ups. But what would my stomach look like if I did 35 sit-ups every day for the next 60 days? One, my stomach would look better, my glycemic index would be lower, and my stomach wouldn't hurt. But I'm more concerned about tomorrow morning than what things look like in the 1st of November. So I take the short view. Now, I know you folks don't do that. That's why I gave that personal example. Because you all take the long view, and you don't make poor decisions. So I'm, I'm happy for you, and I'm trying to get there, but I got a little ways to go still. Make better decisions. Get rid of envy. Think of long-term consequences. You have a homework assignment. Get your pencil out so you can write it down. They're going, not me, man. I'll just write it on my phone. <laughs> I 
I want you to go home this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow, and I want you to read chapters 7 and 8 of The Great Controversy. As you read chapter 7 and 8 of The Great Controversy, I want you to apply the two principles we found today. Refuse envy and focus on long-term consequences. And I want you, at least in your mind or on your paper or on your device, write down every occurrence where you see people failing to do those two principles and then write down on another piece of paper every time you see an occurrence of them doing those two principles and you will be astounded of how bad we as humans make decisions. We can make better decisions. God wants us to make better decisions. He wants us to get rid of the envy, and he'll help. And he wants us to think on the long-term consequences, which is exactly what Jesus has done throughout this process. Somewhere in Scripture it says, Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. Which means I should start learning to think the way Jesus does. Maybe I should start doing those sit-ups. Closing him is number 187. Jesus, a friend for sinners. As we are turning to him, 187, shall we all rise?
Don't forget, birthday cake, David O'Gwin, Sabbath School Room. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that through the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we can make better choices. Lord, you have asked us to make better choices because when we do, we reflect more favorably on your kingdom. It's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would speak to each of us, to nudge us, to help us understand where we have fallen short, and empower us to be that child so that your kingdom is glorified, your kingdom is enhanced, and Jesus might come soon to take us home. Is my prayer in his name. Amen. Amen.